Benjamin Button. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and the that family, which, as every Southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the Confederacy. This was their first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped it would be a boy, so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland Private Hospital for Ladies and Gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps, rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button & Co. Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. Dr. Keene, he called. Oh, Dr. Keene! The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as Mr. Button drew near. What happened? demanded Mr. Button, as he came up in a gasping rush. What was it? How is she? A boy? Who is it? What? Talk sense, said Dr. Keene sharply. He appeared somewhat irritated. Is the child born? begged Mr. Button. Dr. Keene frowned. Why, yes, I suppose so, after a fashion. Again, he threw a curious glance at Mr. Button. Is my wife all right? Yes. Is it a boy or a girl? Here now, cried Dr. Keene in a perfect passion of irritation. I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous! He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away, muttering, Do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation? One more would ruin me, ruin anybody. What's the matter? demanded Mr. Button, appalled. Triplets? No, not triplets, answered the doctor cuttingly. What's more, you can go and see for yourself. And get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years. But I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Goodbye. Then he turned sharply, and without another word, climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbstone, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap had occurred? He had suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that, a moment later, he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. Good morning, she remarked, looking up at him pleasantly. Good morning. I, I am Mr. Button. At this, a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty. I want to see my child said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. Oh, of course, she cried hysterically. 
Upstairs. Right upstairs. Go up. She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in a cool perspiration, turned falteringly and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall, he addressed another nurse who approached him, basin in hand. I'm Mr. Button, he managed to articulate. I want to see my... Clank. The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank, clank. It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. The nurse regained control of herself and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. All right, Mr. Button, she agreed in a hushed voice. Very well. But if you knew what state it's put us all in this morning, it's perfectly outrageous. The hospital will never have the ghost of a reputation after... Hurry, he cried hoarsely. I can't stand this. Come this way then, Mr. Button. He dragged himself after her. At the end of a long hall, they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls. Indeed, a room which, in later parlance, would have been known as the crying room. They entered. Ranged around the walls were half a dozen white enameled rolling cribs, each with a tag tied at the head. Well, gasped Mr. Button, which is mine. There, said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket and partially crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair was almost white, and from his chin dripped a long, smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. Am I mad? thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. Is this some ghastly hospital joke? It doesn't seem like a joke to us, replied the nurse severely, and I don't know whether you're mad or not, but that is most certainly your child. The cool perspiration redoubled on Mr. Button's forehead. He closed his eyes and then, opening them, looked again. There was no mistake. He was gazing at a man of three score and ten, a baby of three score and ten, a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which it was reposing. The old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment, and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice. Are you my father? he demanded. Mr. Button and the nurse started violently. Because if you are went on the old man querulously. I wish you'd get me out of this place, or at least get them to put a comfortable rocker in here. Where in God's name did you come from? Who are you? burst out Mr. Button frantically. I can't tell you exactly who I am, replied the querulous wine because I've only been born a few hours. But my last name is certainly Button. You lie. You're an imposter. The old man turned wearily to the nurse. Nice way to welcome a newborn child, he complained in a weak voice. Tell him he's wrong, why don't you? You're wrong, Mr. Button, said the nurse severely. This is your child, and you'll have to make the best of it. Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short and then dyed to a sparse, unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, and had been attired in small-boy clothes made to order by a flabbergasted tailor, 
it was impossible for Mr. Button to ignore the fact that his son was a poor excuse for a first family baby. Despite his aged stoop, Benjamin Button, for it was by this name they called him, was five feet eight inches tall. His clothes did not conceal this, nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes underneath were faded and watery and tired. But Mr. Button persisted in his unwavering purpose. Benjamin was a baby, and a baby he should remain. At first he declared that if Benjamin didn't like warm milk, he could go without food altogether. But he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and butter, and even oatmeal by way of a compromise. One day he brought home a rattle, and, giving it to Benjamin, insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it, whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day. There can be no doubt, though, that the rattle bored him and that he found other and more soothing amusements when he was left alone. For instance, Mr. Button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before, a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when, entering the nursery unexpectedly, he found the room full of faint blue haze, and Benjamin, with a guilty expression on his face, trying to conceal the butt of a dark Havana. This, of course, called for a severe spanking, but Mr. Button found that he could not bring himself to administer it. He merely warned his son that he would stunt his growth. Nevertheless, he persisted in his attitude. He brought home lead soldiers. He brought toy trains. He brought large, pleasant animals made of cotton. And, to perfect the illusion which he was creating, for himself at least, he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth. But, despite all his father's efforts, Benjamin refused to be interested. He would steal down the back stairs and return to the nursery with a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, over which he would pour through an afternoon while his cotton cows and his Noah's Ark were left neglected on the floor. Against such a stubbornness, Mr. Button's efforts were of little avail. The sensation created in Baltimore was, at first, prodigious. What the mishap would have cost the Buttons and their kinsfolk socially cannot be determined, for the outbreak of the Civil War drew the city's attention to other things. A few people who were unfailingly polite racked their brains for compliments to give to the parents, and finally hit upon the ingenious device of declaring that the baby resembled his grandfather, a fact which, due to the standard state of decay common to all men of seventy, could not be denied. Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were not pleased, and Benjamin's grandfather was furiously insulted. Benjamin, once he left the hospital, took life as he found it. Several small boys were brought to see him, and he spent a stiff-jointed afternoon trying to work up an interest in tops and marbles. He even managed, quite accidentally, to break a kitchen window with a stone from a slingshot, a feat which secretly delighted his father. Thereafter, Benjamin contrived to break something every day, but he did these things only because they were expected of him and because he was by nature obliging. When his grandfather's initial antagonism wore off, Benjamin and that gentleman took enormous pleasure in one another's company. They would sit for hours, these two, so far apart in age and experience, and, like old cronies, discuss with tireless monotony the slow events of the day. Benjamin felt more at ease in his grandfather's presence than in his parents. They seemed always somewhat in awe of him, 
and, despite the dictatorial authority they exercised over him, frequently addressed him as Mr. He was as puzzled as anyone else at the apparently advanced age of his mind and body at birth. He read up on it in the medical journal, but found that no such case had been previously recorded. At his father's urging, he made an honest attempt to play with other boys, and frequently he joined in the milder games. Football shook him up too much, and he feared that in case of a fracture, his ancient bones would refuse to knit. When he was five, he was sent to kindergarten, where he was initiated into the art of pasting green paper on orange paper, of weaving colored maps, and manufacturing eternal cardboard necklaces. He was inclined to drowse off to sleep in the middle of these tasks, a habit which both irritated and frightened his young teacher. To his relief, she complained to his parents, and he was removed from the school. The Roger Buttons told their friends that they felt he was too young. By the time he was twelve years old, his parents had grown used to him. Indeed, so strong is the force of custom that they no longer felt that he was different from any other child, except when some curious anomaly reminded them of the fact. But one day a few weeks after his twelfth birthday, while looking in the mirror, Benjamin made or thought he made, an astonishing discovery. Did his eyes deceive him? Or had his hair turned, in the dozen years of his life, from white to iron gray under its concealing dye? Was the network of wrinkles on his face becoming less pronounced? He could not tell. He knew that he no longer stooped, and that his physical condition had improved since the early days of his life. He went to his father. I am grown, he announced determinedly. I want to put on long trousers. His father hesitated. Well, he said finally, I don't know. Fourteen is the age for putting on long trousers, and you are only twelve. But you'll have to admit, protested Benjamin, that I'm big for my age. Finally, a compromise was reached. Benjamin was to continue to dye his hair. He was to make a better attempt to play with boys of his own age. He was not to wear his spectacles or carry a cane in the street. In return for these concessions, he was allowed his first suit of long trousers. In 1880, Benjamin Button was 20 years old, and he signalized his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button & Co., wholesale hardware. It was in that same year that he began going out socially, that is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now 50, and he and his son were more and more companionable. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still grayish, they appeared about the same age and could have passed for brothers. One night in August, they got into the Phaeton attired in their full-dress suits and drove out to a dance at the Shevlin's country house, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lusterless color of platinum, and late-blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low, half-heard laughter. The open country, carpeted for rods around with bright wheat, was translucent as in the day. It was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky. Almost. There's a great future in the dry goods business, Roger Button was saying. He was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. Old fellows like me can't learn new tricks, he observed profoundly. It's you youngsters with energy and vitality that have the great future before you. Far up the road, the lights of the Shevlin's country house drifted into view, and presently there was a sighing sound that crept persistently toward them, It might have been the fine plaintive violins 
or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. They pulled up behind a handsome broom, whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. An almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him. Blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was ashen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustled dress. Roger Button leaned over to his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncrief, the daughter of General Moncrief. They approached a group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she curtsied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of Baltimore as they eddied around Hildegard Moncrief, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin. How intolerably rosy. Their curling brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, his jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. When, six months later, the engagement of Ms. Hildegard Moncrief to Mr. Benjamin Button was made known, I say made known, for General Moncrief declared he would rather fall upon his sword than announce it, the excitement in Baltimore society reached a feverish pitch. The almost forgotten story of Benjamin's birth was remembered and sent out upon the winds of scandal in picaresque and incredible forms. The Sunday supplements of the New York papers played up the case with fascinating sketches which showed the head of Benjamin Button attached to a fish, to a snake, and, finally, to a body of solid brass. He became known, journalistically, as the Mystery Man of Maryland, but the true story as is usually the case, had a very small circulation. In vain, Mr. Roger Button published his son's birth certificate in large type in the Baltimore Blaze. No one believed it. You had only to look at Benjamin and see. On the part of the two people most concerned, there was no wavering. So many of the stories about her fiancé were false that Hildegard refused stubbornly to believe even the true one. In vain, General Moncrief pointed out to her the high mortality among men of fifty, or, at least, among men who looked fifty. In vain, he told her of the instability of the wholesale hardware business. Hildegard had chosen to marry for mellowness, and marry she did. In one particular, at least, the friends of Hildegard Moncrief were mistaken. The wholesale hardware business prospered amazingly. In the fifteen years between Benjamin Button's marriage in 1880 and his father's retirement in 1895, the family fortune was doubled, and this was due largely to the younger member of the firm. Needless to say, Baltimore eventually received the couple to its bosom. Even old General Moncrief became reconciled to his son-in-law when Benjamin gave him the money to bring out his History of the Civil War in twenty volumes, which had been refused by nine prominent publishers. In Benjamin himself, fifteen years had wrought many changes. 
It seemed to him that the blood flowed with new vigor through his veins. It began to be a pleasure to rise in the morning, to walk with an active step along the busy, sunny street, to work untiringly with his shipments of hammers and his cargoes of nails. It was in 1890 that he executed his famous business coup. He brought up the suggestion that all nails used in nailing up the boxes in which nails are shipped are the property of the shippee. A proposal which became a statute was approved by Chief Justice Fossil and saved Roger Button and Company Wholesale Hardware more than 600 nails every year. In addition, Benjamin discovered that he was becoming more and more attracted by the gay side of life. It was typical of his growing enthusiasm for pleasure that he was the first man in the city of Baltimore to own and run an automobile. Meeting him on the street, his contemporaries would stare enviously at the picture he made of health and vitality. He seems to grow younger every year, they would remark. And if old Roger Button, now sixty-five years old, had failed at first to give a proper welcome to his son, he atoned at last by bestowing on him what amounted to adulation. 